Ambassador Series is brought to you in part by Prairie Heart Institute, the University of Illinois at Springfield, the Corporation for Public Broadcasting, and through the support of viewers like you. Thank you. Welcome, ladies and gentlemen, to another edition of the Ambassador Series. My name is Paul Palazzolo, your Sangamon County Auditor and a volunteer for WSCC, and I'll be serving as your host for this program. Now, this program is a presentation of WSCC-TV in cooperation with the University of Illinois Springfield. The television portion of the program is sponsored in part by the Corporation for Public Broadcasting and through the support of the viewers of WSCC-TV. It'll be broadcast by WSCC and other PBS stations throughout the state. And we encourage you to continue supporting WSCC-TV so that they can continue to bring you programs like this and others that educate, inspire, and entertain. Now, please allow me to introduce our head table to you. Uh, to my right, your left, is Ed Strong at, uh, from WSCC Television. And to your right is our honored guest, Ambassador Michael Collins. And seated next to him is Dr. Richard Ringheisen, Chancellor for the University of Illinois Springfield. With appreciation for a sponsorship gift from Roland Machinery, we also have students from Rochester High School and their teacher, Melinda Bilyeu. And let's give the students from Rochester High School a round of applause for their being here. And it's also an honor to welcome Martin Ruwine, the Consul General from the Consulate General of Ireland in Chicago. Welcome, sir. Our guest today, Ambassador Michael Collins, a native of Dublin City, was educated at Black Rock College and Trinity College in Dublin. He joined the Department of Foreign Affairs in 1974, and his early diplomatic postings brought him to Rome, Italy, and New York. He has served as Ireland's ambassador to Saudi Arabia, and also as ambassador to the Czech Republic and Ukraine. On September 18, 2007, Ambassador Collins presented his credentials to President Bush and was appointed Ireland's ambassador to the United States. In May 2008, Ambassador Collins was honored with the award of Diplomat of the Year by the World Affairs Council of Los Angeles. Ambassador Collins is married to Marie, and they have three sons, Brian, David, and Owen. Please let's welcome to our Ambassador Series stage, Michael Collins. Ambassador. Thank you. Welcome, sir. Thank, thank you very much. Thank you. <clears throat> well, thank you very much indeed. It's, it's just great to be here uh, in Springfield this afternoon. Uh, Chancellor, it's good to meet you again. We, we met last night. Uh, Consul General Martin Ryan, who's my good friend and colleague from our consulate in um, Chicago. Uh, distinguished guests, ladies and gentlemen, I had the honor earlier on this morning of uh, calling on the mayor, Mayor Tim Devlin, and he told me that today has been designated as Ambassador Michael Collins Day 2010 in Springfield. So the rest of the afternoon is free for you all. Um, <laughs> But no, it's, it's great to be here and it's wonderful to get out of Washington and I commend uh, everybody involved in the organization of this wonderful series, the university, the television station, um, the WSEC. Um, it's a tremendous thing to do and it's great also for an ambassador to come out and come into the heartland and to meet the real people of the United States in this locality and we're very glad to do it. It's good for us and hopefully it's also good for you. Um, I'm going to speak to you today about Ireland, obviously, about Ireland um, today, Ireland 2010 a little bit about our relationship with the United States, a little bit in particular about our relationship with our wonderful community in the United States, a little bit about our economy and where we're going and the challenges that we face, Ireland's place in Europe and Ireland's place in the world generally. Uh, but before that, I'd just like to recall that um, I don't know who was here between October uh, 1919 and today, but I do know that in October 1919, a very famous Irish man visited um, Springfield, Illinois. And that was our, what was then to become our future president, President Eamon de Valera. He was a very distinguished visitor here in 1919. 
at a time when the Irish state was uh, beginning to emerge. We, had, we hadn't yet achieved our independence. It took another two years to achieve our independence, but he came to the United States to fundraise and to try and um, uh, finance uh, the emerging um, Irish uh, independence that came in 1920. And I know also that he, he did uh, meet here uh, with, the, um, um, with a lady called Miss Ava Evans, who was the, um, a descendant of Abraham Lincoln. And I don't know whether this is true or not. In fact, Abraham Lincoln was her grand uncle. And um, uh, according to the story anyway, or the history, um, Ava Evans presented to President de Valera, as the person who was going to become President de Valera, a locket containing a shamrock uh, from the garden of Abraham Lincoln. Now, if you can believe that, <laughs> well and good. <laughs> but in any event, all I'm really saying is that before I came here today, there were others here before me flying the flag of Ireland and obviously um, um, uh, uh, connecting with the great people of Springfield. I'll say it's a great uh, a pleasure to be here and to be in Springfield. And this is a city and this is a place um, full of Irish names and full of Irish spirit. I feel you know, truly at home in the company of the, the Kellys, the O'Briens, the Murphys, the Devlins, the O'Sheas, and so many other names that can only be Irish. And I know that in addition to people here of Irish distraction, extraction, there are also some people from Ireland itself, and I particularly like to salute some of them uh, as well. It is my privilege uh, to serve as Ireland's ambassador to the United States and to serve as ambassador anywhere, and I've served as ambassador to Saudi Arabia and the Czech Republic, is a great privilege. Uh, but to serve as Ireland's ambassador to the United States is a particular privilege. And um, every day I wake up and I say, you know, what have I done you know, to deserve this incredible honour that, that my government has given me with, and I've, I like to believe also that I've worked hard to achieve. But it is a great honour to be here, and it's a great honour, obviously, to connect in the ways that we do uh, with our people here and with the great American community as well. I'm conscious that I share the role, therefore, of ambassador with no less than 44 million people in this country who also claim to be Irish or of Irish extraction. That's a great number of people, but that's the number of people who have Irish descent, Irish identity. And this is not just a make-up figure by the Irish uh, at home to try and make themselves feel bigger and better, but this is a figure, of, um, this is a, a figure that comes from the US Census where people are asked uh, a question in relation to ethnicity. And no less than 35 million people put themselves down as Irish, coming from Ireland in some way, one way or another, and another six million or so put themselves down as Scots-Irish, who are you know, Irish as well, uh, but obviously came uh, originally from Scotland through Ireland. So it's a great number of people, and it's a great number of people to connect with. I'd say it's a unique position to be in. Uh, there are tr truly very uh, few other small countries like Ireland where only four million people, only four million people, just uh, slightly more than four million people. When I give you an idea, that's about the size of, uh, uh, well, about a sixth of the size of Texas. And the, the, the place of Ireland in Europe and the place of Ireland in the world, we would fit 10 times physically into the state of Texas. So we're a small place, but with pretty big attitude and a pretty big footprint <laughs> around the world. <laughs> As I say, we share an extraordinary depth of, of, of bonds with, our, with the United States over many, many gener generations. And the contribution of successive waves um, of Irish immigrants to the United States is woven into the story of America itself because the Irish have been here from the very beginning. Indeed, I believe that the very first cabin in the settlement of Springfield was built in 1820 by one John Kelly. The Great Famine in Ireland in the 1840s, of which you'll have heard so much, saw a huge increase in Irish emigration and coincided with the growth of cities like uh, Chicago. And indeed, in 1850, one in five of the city's population had been born in Ireland. The wave of Irish emigrants in the late 1840s and 1850s came here with nothing in their hands and nothing in their pockets. They came here as labourers, they came here as miners, they came here as construction workers, they came here as railway workers. And I think one or two of them might even have gone into politics. <laughs> <laughs> to borrow the words of Robert Fitzgerald, the great Irish-American poet from Illinois, we made this journey not from desire, a thirst, the thirst to find a better life. Irish people and their descendants over the generations took to every sphere of American life and they found their place in the history of this great country. From the signing of the Declaration of Independence to the Civil War, to the boardrooms, the sports fields, the police stations and the fire stations, the schoolrooms and the research labs of the present day, you will find the Irish. The sons and daughters of miners and construction workers lived 
the American dream. So today, in every corner of America, and I've traveled to every corner of America, but in every corner of America, there is Irish America, proud, successful, and resilient. The extraordinary phenomenon that is Irish America lies at the heart of the relationship that Ireland enjoys with the United States. It is not a connection based on strategic foreign policy or economic calculations. It is instead a living bond deeply felt by millions and millions of people. In this home of Abraham Lincoln, I'm reminded of something he once said in a letter to one Joseph Gillespie in July 1849. He said that the better part of one's life consists of friendships. And let me say that Ireland and America enjoy a unique friendship. And we work very hard, day and daily, to keep it like that. For Ireland, Irish America is a resource and a connection of incalculable importance and significance. And we know also how important it is for us to protect and to nurture this connection in every way that we can. That is why the government in Ireland asked me to undertake recently a strategic review of this relationship, which was a very timely thing to do. Because I can say to you that over many decades, the relationship with Ireland, between Ireland and the United States, was driven in large measure by the concerns that we had over the situation in Ireland, and particularly in Northern Ireland, and the ongoing troubles that we had there. And thankfully, with peace having been achieved in Ireland, and I'll come to that again in a minute, we were in a position maybe to better reflect on what we should now be doing uh, to connect with the United States, to connect with our community here, and to have a new sense of purpose and a new sense of relevance. So I undertook this review entitled, Ireland and America, Challenges and Opportunities in a New Context. And that new context is indeed peace in Ireland. And this confirmed the very special characteristics of our unique relationship and the efforts that need to be undertaken to keep it fresh and vibrant in these changed times. And that is why also the Irish uh, government um, convened a very special event in Ireland last September called the Global Irish Economic Forum to reach out in new and exciting ways to the global Irish family. Because if we say, as we do, that there are 40 million people in this country with an Irish connection, we know that there are globally 70 million people with Irish connections. This is an incredible resource and we are looking for new and better ways of being connected with them and connecting them with us. This afternoon, I greatly value the opportunity to discuss the Ireland of 2010. It's a new Ireland, proud of its past, building for its future. I would like to reflect on a few things that shape Ireland's perspective in these times. Our economy, our own experience of conflict and peace, Ireland's place in Europe, and as I say, our very special connection with the United States. And I'd be more than happy, as, 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 as you know, to take any questions that you may have at the end of the session and to answer them as best I can. These are very challenging times indeed. Challenging for America, challenging, challenging for Ireland, and challenging for the world. In Ireland, we are beginning our recovery from an economic crisis that swept with unprecedented speed across the world's economies. Ireland, having experienced a long period of economic growth, very strong economic growth, which transformed our country and transformed our economy, was hit hard by the global crisis. Like some parts of the United States, in the last few years we've had a significant part of our economy built up around property and construction. This sector was particularly affected in the downturn that simultaneously hit our exports, our tourism sector, and of course our financial sector. Also, while our membership of the euro currency area, because Ireland uses the euro currency, brings strong monetary stability, its very strength makes it harder for our exports, particularly in the UK and in the US. I'm going to talk to you a little bit about the bad news in Ireland before I get to the good news, as I will do, obviously. But in Ireland, Ireland's GDP, GDP gross domestic product, is estimated to have contracted by 7.5% in 2009. 
and is projected, projected to contract another one and a quarter percent in 2010. Unemployment, which was previously at about four and a half percent, will probably reach 13 percent this year. That's the bad news. It's certainly not good news. Painful and very difficult. The good news is, we hope, that the end of the economic downturn is indeed in sight. In sight in Ireland, in sight in the United States, and in sight globally. We have taken very strong corrective steps to reboot our economy, which should see growth later in 2010 and even stronger results in 2011. The narrative for Ireland over the last decade, 15 years indeed, has been one of extraordinary growth, extraordinary resilience, extraordinary success, to such an extent that we were branded as the Celtic Tiger. And indeed we were a tiger economy. We were forging ahead in an extraordinary way. But as I say, coming towards the back of 2008, you know, with the world recession uh, reaching a crisis point, we, as I said earlier on, were particularly badly hit and we had to take very severe measures to correct uh, the imbalances in our economy. We've had to take special measures to get our spending uh, under control, including instituting sp serious spending cuts, including in the public sector. So when I hear in this country, you know, people talking about small wage increases or freezing wages, uh, in Ireland we have gone to the extent of actually cutting wages, almost uniquely so in Europe. Uh, <coughs> In the public service alone, we've taken pay hits, uh, pay cuts, anything from 5% to 15% on top of 10% last year. So that's pretty severe, pretty serious, but it had to be done you know, to correct, I'd say, the imbalances in the public account. We have stabilised our domestic banking sector and have in initiated a plan to remove to toxic assets and loans from their books to allow them to resume borrowing. As I say, none of this is particularly unique to Ireland. But obviously, uh, we, like everyone else, have to take measures to make sure that we're poised for recovery, we're poised for growth when the world economy begins to grow strongly again. Our key investment clusters, and we have many, but of pharmaceuticals and medical devices and ICT, as well as a growing focus on clean tech, position us very well to take advantage of the global recovery. And as I say, we are seeing wage and prices adjusting to these new circumstances, ensuring that competitiveness in Ireland in these crucial sectors will be good in the future. In Ireland today, after a long, long history of emigration and economic difficulty in one form or another over the generations, we now have a new generation who know the benefits of economic growth and have a belief in Ireland's potential. They believe in Ireland, they have confidence in Ireland, and they believe that Ireland will recover strongly. And if I could just say to you, you know, while all the headlines tend to be negative, and a lot of the headlines out of Europe tend to bracket Ireland among the countries that are most challenged, I should just say to you that despite all the downturn, real living standards in Ireland remain high by international standards, much higher than they were a generation ago. In fact, Ireland's income per capita is expected to level off, despite all the downturn, at around 90 to 95 percent of the European average. This compares to some 65 percent of the European average in 1980. Central to Ireland's growth, central to Ireland's economic prosperity, is our link with the United States. The Irish-US economic relationship is one of mutual benefit and is stronger now than at any time in our history. Direct investment by US companies in Ireland employs some 95,000 people. Illinois companies like Abbott Labs have used Ireland as a base in Europe since 1946. But there's another side to the story as well. And that is that in return, Irish companies now employ some 82,000 people in the United States, including companies like the Kerry Group, Cuisine de France, and Syncreon here in Illinois. Combined investment, that's the two-way investment in our two countries, is some 90 billion US dollars. And indeed, in recent years, Ireland into the United States 
has been one of the top 10 investors. The United States is Ireland's second largest trading partner and our largest export market, with annual trade in goods and services between the two countries of something in the region of 70 billion US dollars. Ireland is an ideal base for US worldwide companies accessing the European and regional markets. And I know, I hope you don't think it's insensitive for me to talk a little bit about US investment into Ireland when there are issues to do with you know, job creation in the United States. But when we talk about US investment into Ireland, we're talking about companies that are global companies, that are in the global market space, that need to be in the European market space of 500 million people. And as far as we are concerned, if they want to come to the European market space, we want them to come to Ireland. So Ireland is an ideal base for US worldwide companies accessing the European and regional markets. We want and we welcome US investment in Ireland of US global companies looking for a base in Europe then they will find Ireland culturally and economically a proven fit. We offer a low corporation tax rate of 12.5%. That's 12.5% for all manufacturing in Ireland, whether it's inward investment or whether it's domestic investment. 12.5% is the tax rate for, the, for these investments, corporation tax rate. We are the only English-speaking country in the euro currency area. We have the youngest population in Europe, and we like to believe also one of the best educated populations in Europe. We have embraced globalism, globalization with open, stable, business friendly policies, incentivizing high value research and innovation led activities. As a result, the Ireland of today is the European home to the operations of leading cutting edge companies like Google, Facebook, Microsoft, Apple, Yahoo, as well as Johnson & Johnson, Pfizer, Coca-Cola, and many, many more, and we're very proud of that. In a world whose economy is rebalancing, once driven by the US consumer, now looking to the emerging economies in China, India, Brazil as an engine, the economic and political links between the United States and Europe are a stabilizing presence and a leading model and we're very proud to play our role in all of that. I'd like now, if I may, just to digress a little bit, but very importantly, and to reflect on a development of central importance and significance to Ireland and for Ireland. And that is the peace that Ireland today enjoys. Any of my predecessors who might have come here in previous years or over the last four decades who gave an address like this would have been talking about one thing above all else, and that was the conflict in Northern Ireland. A conflict that claimed three and a half thousand lives in one very small place has been transformed. And when I tell you perhaps three and a half thousand lives, just to give you an idea of the scale of what that involved, over a 30 year period, which is almost the equivalent period, say, of Vietnam, and sometimes at the height of these um, troubles, uh, when we were trying to convey a sense of the scale of the tragedy that was Northern Ireland at that time, I would say to people uh, in a population of Northern Ireland with one and a half million people, that you would need to construct a, um, a Vietnam Wall five times longer to get a sense of the proportion and the impact in a very small space that is Northern Ireland of three and a half thousand fatalities. But as I say, that conflict has now been transformed. That conflict has now ended. And remarkably, uh, because it's remarkable in the history of Ireland, Republican, Catholic, Protestant, loyalist paramilitary groups have ended their campaigns. And more particularly, they have decommissioned their weapons. Um, it's a very unique thing to, and it's a very, um, obviously it's a very um, satisfying thing to see something like this, something that was so tragic brought to a successful conclusion. Um, but bringing it to the point where people can have confidence that it has truly ended is another challenge yet again. And from the period 2001 to 2007, when I worked in Dublin, as I did working with our Prime Minister, my job was to make sure that this peace process worked. And um, one of the issues that was an issue at that time was, what about the weapons? What about the explosives? What about all the instruments of battle and war? Where are they and how can we have confidence 
that they won't be used and that they're gone. Under the peace agreement, the idea was that they would be decommissioned. <coughs> or the words that were used were that they would be put beyond use, which was another word for decommissioning. Very emotional thing, very sensitive <coughs> thing, all sorts of issues connected with it. But we did set up an international body called an International Decommissioning Body, which is unique to Ireland and chaired by a Canadian uh, called General John de Chastelin, who coincidentally was also the Canadian ambassador to, to Washington many, many years ago. And he's the chairman of that body. And they, he and his, his colleagues, oversaw, certified and had witnesses to the decommissioning of IRA weapons and Protestant parliamentary weapons as well. So when we say the weapons are gone, it's not a case of the Irish government saying the weapons are gone. It's not a case of the British government saying the weapons are gone. It's not a case of the Americans saying the weapons are gone. <coughs> it's a case of an independent commission in which the Americans are also represented, by the way, saying that the weapons are gone. And that is something that's very, very important for confidence. That's very important for the peace process. It is also the case that all the parties in Northern Ireland, former adversaries, are now in government together, led by those, as I say, who had once been one another's greatest enemies. The governments of Ireland and Britain worked side by side, and that was also part of my responsibilities, working with the then Prime Minister of Ireland, then Taoiseach of Ireland, to work with British Prime Minister Tony Blair in particular, to work side by side with him, and to have the two governments drive this process to completion. Uh, but it's our responsibility still to consolidate the gains that have been made and to continue to build a stable foundation for future generations to live in peace and prosperity in Ireland. This was a peace process built on dialogue, on inclusivity, on human rights, <coughs> and fundamentally on democracy. And while hurdles remain, there will always be hurdles, there will always be issues. It is nonetheless one of the most successful peace processes currently in the world. As I say, it's also a process that demands daily patience and tenacity. And even in these days, and even in these hours <laughs> as we speak, uh, there are outstanding issues that the two governments and the parties in Northern Ireland are seeking to address in order to complete the last remaining steps of a very long journey. At the heart of what is Northern Ireland today, at the heart of, peace, of the peace process, is the Good Friday Agreement of 1998. The overwhelming endorsement of that agreement by the people of Ireland in referendums, both in the North of Ireland and in the South, gave us the mandate and the momentum to get through the ensuing 10 years and more of difficult implementation and delicate negotiations. Since 2007, Northern Ireland has enjoyed shared partnership government, as I said. New arrangements for cooperation on the island of Ireland are being implemented. And relations between Dublin and London, once deeply strained by the conflict in Northern Ireland, have been transformed. Our own experience is a story of countless hands and imaginations at work to the common goal of peace. And a great many of them came from here. Our success is a tribute to the extraordinary efforts of people who got involved and supported that peace process on both sides of the Atlantic. I think, of course, of Senator George Mitchell, of President Clinton, of President Bush, and of the late and much missed Senator Ted Kennedy. And indeed the ongoing support of President Obama and his administration, as well as from members of the Congress from both sides of the aisle, is tremendously important to us and deeply appreciated. Secretary Clinton's recent visit to Ireland and her appointment of an economic envoy to Northern Ireland are evidence of US engagement, commitment and willingness to stay involved involved and to help us consolidate peace in Ireland and build a better future for everyone. I should just say it might seem obvious that a US Secretary of State would visit Ireland and uh, many people might presume that US Secretaries of State visit Ireland the whole time. But I had the uh, privilege of being with Secretary Clinton in Ireland and I informed her that to the best of my knowledge the best of my knowledge, she was the first US Secretary of State ever to visit Dublin on a working visit. She said, that cannot be true. I said, well, <laughs> I haven't yet found anybody to contradict me. 
So we are very um, um, indebted, obviously, uh, to her um, ongoing support, and she travelled to Northern Ireland after she was in Dublin. And I cannot tell you what a difference it has meant to all of what we've achieved in Ireland to have these, if I may call them, external but friendly voices, particularly from the United States, because we would call Northern Ireland a very narrow place, a very small place, a very claustrophobic place. In the very, very beginning, the British government didn't even want my government to be a part of the settlement. Eventually, of course, it was perfectly obvious that we had to be part of any settlement. The British government thereafter didn't want the American government to be involved. You know, that was further kind of complicating the issue. And, but ultimately, the American government did get involved. And the message there <coughs> is that all of these things, opening the windows, letting in some fresh air, letting in some fresh thinking, uh, breaking away from some of the traditional ways of doing things, did help us greatly. And as I say, the United States played a, a noble role in all of that. American leaders in politics, business, and the wider community choose to make, chose to make Ireland, our peace in Ireland, a priority. Many, but not all, were Irish Americans and felt a pull of kinship that in turn had a special influence on those in Ireland. It is therefore also an extraordinary example of American, what I may call, soft power at work and the results it can yield in the right circumstances. Soft power may not be able to solve every problem in the world, but it's good to have Ireland as an example of when it did work and work to such good effect. I hope that this is a story, and we hope in Ireland that this is a story which offers others in situations of conflict um, some succor and some relief, and that they can draw some inspiration, some comfort, or even a lesson or two, despite the great differences between them all, because no two conflicts are alike. They may have their similarities. Um, they may have other things in common, but we appreciate that no two conflicts are quite um, identical. But having said that, uh, you know, I can say with absolute um, 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 conviction that over the period of 20, 30 years, there were many, many mistakes made on all sides in Ireland. Um, mistakes made by governments, mistakes made by political parties, uh, mistakes made at community level. Um, you know, we are in the business now of sharing our experience with countries that are themselves emerging, emerging from conflict. Not with a view to demonstrating in any way how good we are or, or, or uh, what, what we have achieved, because it took us in many ways an unconscionable length of time you know, to go from the very beginning of this conflict so far, so far back to reaching the finality that we did. But if, to, if, there's, if there's anything of what we experienced that we can share with others, to have them avoid some of the mistakes that perhaps we made or to learn some of the lessons from what we did, we're very much part of uh, seeking to share that with them. More generally, Ireland has engaged with the world around us. We have never as a country been detached. How could we be? We're a small place, we're outward looking. Our people have been travelers for generations and over the centuries. We are first and foremost a believer in an effective multilateral system. And through our membership of the United Nations, the United Nations in particular, we support and utilize rules-based, so we support and utilize a rules-based world, a world of cooperation for mutual benefit. Over many decades, indeed, we have sent peacekeepers around the world from the Congo to the Lebanon, to Cyprus, to Liberia, to Chad. And Ireland has become one of the world's leading development aid donors, also responding generously in the global efforts to help the people of Haiti after the devastating earthquake there. I think I just, just comment a little bit on that development assistance. We have an aspiration, there's a global aspiration in the United Nations to reach 0.7% of GNP um, in development assistance to the third world by 2012. And obviously the current or the recent um, economic setback has kind of affected things generally. But we genuinely like to believe that during the period when we had the money, when we, were, we had money available to us, that we were um, more than full in our commitment, um, not just to building our own country, but to serving the poor of the world as well. Because it would be a very strange Ireland indeed, who is, which itself had experienced poverty and which itself saw its people emigrate if it, if it turned its back on the poorest of the poor. So we have been trying to maintain our commitment to these targets, these development targets, and it's very much part of where we stand today in the world, our relationship with developing countries and trying to help them as we try also to build our own economy. 
But if the United Nations and our global outreach is, um, is important to us, it is perhaps the greatest, um, it is probably the European Union, of which Ireland has been a member since 1973, that is the most significant vehicle for Ireland's engagement in the world today. A union now of 27 member states, created to be its own peace process for a con continent that had been torn apart by war at regular intervals over the centuries and over history. It has met its original goals so successfully, peace through economic integration in Europe, that it is now almost taken for granted. And Ireland had the privilege to steer and lead the European Union in, 2000, in the particular period in 2004. And we were proud of the role that we played to oversee the expansion of the European Union to include member states previously separated from us by the Iron Curtain. The EU has become a groundbreaking organisation in a host of other ways, allowing for unprecedented depth and breadth of cooperation across a huge range of activities. A single trading market of 500 million people, a single currency for many of its members, including Ireland, and free movement of people and business, a coordinated voice also in world affairs. Recently, the European Union ratified what's called the Treaty of <coughs> Lisbon. And this is a treaty which will allow the expanded European Union uh, a new set of rules to allow it to operate more effectively and more democratically in the global sphere. And Ireland is very, very proud to play our part in the new Europe, while, losing, while not losing, of course, any of our distinctive voice, our culture, our, our own identity. And one of the great parts of that identity is our link with America and with Irish America. These strands that I've tried to describe, our affinity with the United States, our place in Europe, are not in tension. They do not divide us, rather they jointly expand our horizons and our potential. <coughs> 30 years ago, Ireland knew terrible violent conflict on our island, as well as economic distress and emigration. And as I say, like many other countries, we are facing tough times. But the progress we have made in this generation is extraordinary and will not be erased. And as I say, the people of Ireland are in a better position today with a growing younger population, more skilled and more education on our side than they ever have been in the past. We have built a strong foundation of an expanded, diverse economy directed to innovation and the future. We have built a strong foundation of shared and peaceful future on the island of Ireland. And we have built and are determined to maintain strong links to the world through our long and still vibrant relationship with the United States and our active membership of the European community. And throughout all of this, we've enjoyed an upsurge in creativity and excellence across all of the art forms for which Ireland is so well known. Our culture, our dance, our music, our literature, our theatre are stronger than ever before and generated, generate huge positive international appeal, in particular in the United States. Indeed, when people think about Ireland today, or when they used to think about Ireland in the past, it was peace, it was a conflict. The means by which most Americans think of Ireland today is probably through culture. Culture is the medium through which your modern Ireland, more, more, now, more so now than ever before, connects with the outside world. So, peace in Ireland, an economy moving towards recovery and renewed growth, proudly Irish, but positioned at the very heart of Europe, and a relationship with America and its people that is strong and enduring. You know, that is Ireland's story in 2010, the story of which we're very proud, and it's a story and it's a course on which we've set for the succeeding years and the succeeding generations. Thank you very much indeed. Thank you, Ambassador. One of the first questions from our participants today, and uh, with this question, I'm sure you, after you hear it, will know that you have a captive and inclined audience, both here and at home. What's the status of tourism in Ireland? If you have never been to Ireland, you need to go. <laughs> 
Tourism is, is a very important part of our, of our economy. Um, we encourage as many Americans, Irish Americans and others uh, to visit Ireland. Um, interestingly, despite the, uh, the downturn here and the downturn at home, despite the, the, um, the weakness of the dollar, vis-a-vis -vis the euro, 2009 was a pretty good year, relatively speaking, for tourism out of the United States and into Ireland. In fact, I think it, it even grew marginally. For us, it's very important to maintain this, this, this uh, tourism uh, market. We now market the island of Ireland. One of the advantages of the Good Friday Agreement is that we no longer market Ireland separately between Northern Ireland and the Republic. That doesn't make sense. Uh, so Ireland is marketed as one location for American tourism and remains a high priority for us. For us, our number one tourism market is probably, inward tourism market is probably the UK into Ireland. But the United States obviously is extremely important to us as well. And I just, at the weekend I was down in, in Florida and I was, it may not be terribly surprising given the fact that it was Florida and the emphasis on golf in Florida. But I was, I was flabbergasted by every uh, single person who seemed to come up to me, seemed to have uh, played golf in Ireland, and, uh, which uh, is great. Uh, if you play golf, uh, and uh, it, therefore for, for many people like that, for those specialised holidays, whether it's golf or whether it's fishing or uh, that kind of thing, it offers a very uh, happy destination indeed. So we, um, we welcome all Americans, we welcome all, um, we welcome all visitors generally. Tourism is important here as it is important for uh, Springfield, and uh, I say it was, uh, just, it was very gratifying to go downtown this morning and to see what you have done uh, in your Lincoln Centre, the, the, the museum, the library there. And, and, and what an effect that has had on your tourism into Springfield and this area generally. Um, we're all, obviously it's a very competitive world out there. We have to offer something uh, which is um, good value, which is competitive, uh, but we're in that space. And as I say, uh, Ireland will always be a welcome space and a welcome home from people, for people from the United States. Thank you. I was going to save this as a closer, but you had a nice segue into it. Um, you play golf, and if so, what is your favorite course to play in Ireland and in the U.S.? I don't play golf. <laughs> but, you know, um, I, so I don't, I, don't, I don't play golf. It's, um, I wish I did because, um, I mean, you'd have, um, you know, people seem to uh, derive such enormous joy and, 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 um, and um, uh, enrichment from it. But in Ireland, uh, you know, the, the, the courses which people consistently talk about, I mean, and maybe people in this room have already played them, places like Ballybunion, Doonbeg, Old Head of Kinsale, Port Marnock, all of these places are, are renowned. And it's, there's, there's any number of them um, which have now established uh, international standing. And uh, I think what people seem to do is, um, and certainly our American friends and visitors seem to do, is they go on a little odyssey, you know, which brings them around all of these courses uh, in sequence, and um, uh, and obviously they play golf, but obviously they they they, they enjoy the countryside and and the um, and the living in Ireland well during that. So I say golf is the vehicle through which they travel to Ireland, or for which they travel to Ireland. But of course, there's a lot, a lot more to Ireland than golf. We have a rich cultural um, 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 foundation, and I think it's, um, it's 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 a very good location if people want to, as I say, um, um, come and have a relaxing time. Ambassador, has Ireland experienced a surge of immigration from other European countries? And if yes, how well have these folks been assimilated into the culture and economy? Well, that, that's a very, very good question um, indeed, because um, the answer is yes. Um, you know, Ireland for generations has been a country which exported its people, and, and there have been many uh, and saw waves of, of immigration. But in the last um, uh, 10 years and during the height of the economic boom, in Ireland. We were also, since 2004, um, at the location, the chosen location for inward uh, uh, migration, particularly from the new member states of the European Union and within that particularly countries like Poland. So to give you some idea what that means, you know, Ireland has been uh, over the generations an homogenous country. We are 95% we a Catholic country, 100% uh, ourselves. There was no, uh, there was no um, ethnic mix in the country to, to speak of. Um, or in our workforce. Um, to, to cater for the expansion that was going on in Ireland, we couldn't supply people at home. Our unemployment at that stage was 4%, which in our statistical terms is almost full employment. Uh, so to continue the growth, you know, people came to, to build our 
to build our roads, to build our houses, to build our, uh, to build our economy generally. Uh, so at one stage, and it's changed a little bit since, at one stage 15% of our workforce had become uh, new Irish, as we could say, or, or non-Irish. Uh, you know, so 15% of our workforce had become, uh, had come from outside of Ireland, which is an extraordinary figure, uh, extraordinary because of its size, but extraordinary because of its rapidity as well. If I tell you that in the United Kingdom, in Britain, 15% of the workforce in Britain is non-British. They are from other countries, generally Commonwealth countries, maybe India, Pakistan and beyond. But that's the kind of, a, that's grown up over generations, after generations. In Ireland, we're talking about a period of five years, where we went from almost zero uh, in our country, uh, comprising new immigrants, new people, to almost, um, of the workforce, 15%. Um, of course that's involved uh, challenges, um, and it's now involved um, additional challenges because as the downturn has occurred, it's indeed in many of the sectors that many of these people came in to work in, like the construction uh, uh, area in particular, that have been hardest hit. So the question was and is, um, what, what now? Do they leave? Because they're all, first of all, the key point to make, they're all legally in Ireland. They were legally entitled to be in Ireland. They are legally entitled to be in Ireland. They're insured workers from other member states of the European Union who were legally in Ireland as and from the 1st of May 2004. But the question was and is, uh, you know, do they remain in Ireland on welfare or do they take their chances elsewhere? You know, go back home, for example, back to Poland, for example, which is doing quite well. Um, and the answer seems to be a bit of both. Um, there is a statistic out there which suggests that maybe 25 to 30 percent have chosen to move on. Um, the key point is uh, they have a right to remain if they wish. Uh, and it's our challenge for those who do remain uh, to try and integrate them into our schools, to integrate them into our societies, because they have rights and we have obligations. To give you just one final little anecdote, uh, I, my sister is a teacher, and she teaches um, a school, a primary school, or you say an elementary school in the west of Ireland. Again, and she would have been educated by the Mercy Nuns uh, in Dublin. And, um, you know, she would have been um, taught all those years ago how to, uh, very well how to teach, but mainly how to teach an Irish community, indigenously Irish, Catholic, uh, uh, on a, a, you know, almost without exception. Uh, she told me recently that um, in her school, which is a rural school, not a rural school, it's in the, in, the, in, the, in the city of Galway, she has 20 different nationalities and 15 different religions. You know, so, uh, you know, and that's an interesting challenge, I can tell you, but I mean, she's doing very well, but I mean, it's, uh, we, obviously we, we need to uh, be very mindful of the fact that there is a job to be done in terms of proper integration, bringing people along and making them included in our, in our society. Thank you. What, con what concerns does Ireland currently have with terrorism? We have, um, fortunately we have seen an end to what was the campaign of, of violence in our own country. Um, there are still small elements um, uh, who are maybe uh, very, very small elements who are not supportive of the Good Friday Agreement, but they are truly in a minority. I'm not saying they're not dangerous, but they are, they obviously have to be, uh, they have to be, um, we have to be very vigilant about that. Obviously, we're part of the wider community, the wider global community, the wider European community, and we work in close partnership <coughs> with, our, with, our, with our friends and with our partners and with the international community to deal with um, um, uh, terrorism in every way that we can. Uh, we ourselves have not been um, uh, in any way uh, uh, targeted, um, uh, but obviously we are, we are part of the international network and like every, every other country, uh, we too uh, need to remain and be uh, vigilant uh, you know, and to be responsive to any issues that arise uh, in, among those who are determined to do, uh, to do, to do damage and to, to create havoc. What is the extent of the Catholic Church's influence today? Is it on the decline or gaining strength? Well, the, the um, you know, Ireland traditionally, as you, you would all know, has been um, traditionally and, and, and strongly Roman Catholic. Catholic. Um, I, I think the, the church has been going through its own uh, challenges and difficulties. Um, um, again, uh, you know, not as, as, it, as, it, as perhaps it has been doing, um, experiencing in other countries as well. They have been beset in recent years by, by a number of issues, a number of scandals, uh, particularly in relation to, to child issues, child abuse issues, that kind of thing. 
which have um, have convulsed them uh, in, in a very um, serious way. So there have been a number of investigations, a number of resignations indeed as well, uh, you know, a number of um, um, circumstances arising which I'd say you know, have not been uh, unique to Ireland uh, but have certainly taken people aback and you know uh, uh, what its future implications are for the strength of the church I, I can't say but uh, I would say that that obviously um, you, know, the, the, you know these things have not been without uh, consequence so I mean as Ireland has kind of gone forward in a kind of a um, in, in terms of development and growth obviously it does affect people's relationship at times with the, with the the, the traditional ways in which they would have connected with religion, uh, whether in schools or whether in you know, going to church or whatever. But I mean, the, the religious, to, to say, uh, to, to make a, an important point, I mean, the religious and the religious communities in Ireland have played an extraordinarily uh, you know, positive role uh, you know, over many generations in the education of, of Irish people, in the hospitals uh, in particular, where they've run many, many very good hospitals. So it, the problem at the moment is that people are only seeing the negatives and are many people are there there's an emphasis on the negatives and you know some of the extraordinary contribution of Irish uh, men and women uh, in religious life you know maybe have been a little bit obscured and that contribution also I should just say and acknowledge is something which um, uh, gives Ireland such an incredibly good reputation globally as well so whatever uh, what I said earlier on about you know there being Irish America in every corner of America I mean the same is almost true anywhere you go in the world you will find Irish there, and more particularly, you will find that the Irish uh, missionaries have been there in the most far from places in the world. Uh, so to the extent that Ireland you know, has a standing and a reputation in the world, a large measure of that is derived from the contribution over many, many generations uh, by men, uh, in, in men and women in religious life. So they're going through a tough time. Uh, their challenge, obviously, is, to, is to, to face up to their responsibilities. And obviously, like in the United States, whether it's in Boston or whether it's in Los Angeles, uh, emerge from it uh, in new and stronger ways. As you know, we in the US are working to respond to health care needs. How does Ireland as a country deal with health care, and what are the costs? Do you know, um, before the onset of the, um, you know, the, the global recession and all the issues that arise uh, within that and the challenges we had in managing all of that, um, I remember living in Dublin and every day it was an issue to do with healthcare. Every day, you know, when we had, you know, when, when these other big mega issues uh, before they came uh, on us, I mean, the issues were waiting lists in hospitals, people lying on trolleys, all that kind of thing. So, I mean, uh, ma managing a healthcare system, obviously we have a wealth, health, healthcare system which is, more, um, um, which is more developed than yours in terms of uh, people's access to it, public access to it, um, but it's not without its challenges. It's, it's obviously like, like, like here as well, there are major cost issues associated with it. I can't remember the actual figures as well, but the management of the health, healthcare system, the cost of the healthcare system, and making sure also that the healthcare system does what it's intended to do in terms of service to the people. Uh, they are challenges, not just in the United States, but they are also, they've also been challenges for us. But in terms of, you know, we have a different, um, a different system, uh, but, uh, you know, there is public access to it. Uh, nobody needs to be in Ireland without health care uh, available to them. Uh, but uh, that having said that, it, it obviously has its own uh, management and, 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 and financial challenges, which are an issue not just for governments in Ireland and in the United States, but they seem to be kind of almost universal. Ambassador, can you please comment on Ireland's view and role regarding the Middle East peace process? Yes, I can. Um, uh, you know, the, the Middle East peace process obviously is something that um, affects us all in so many ways. Uh, it is gratifying and it's encouraging uh, that one of the first appointments that the Obama administration made was the appointment of Senator George Mitchell. Uh, to the role of, of a special peace uh, envoy to the Middle East. George, George Mitchell to us has heroic status. Uh, you know, he was for us a key architect in bringing peace to Ireland. And uh, many people would say if he could bring peace to Ireland, you know, he could bring peace to the Middle East. But obviously, as I said earlier on, each location, each place has its own complexities, its own challenges. Uh, what I would say overall is that um, uh, you know, if you take Ireland as an example, we achieved our first ceasefire in 1994. Uh, there was obviously there been one or two uh, incidents, some of them grievous, uh, in, the, in the intervening period. That's 16 years ago. 
We achieved the Good Friday Agreement in 1998, that's 12 years ago. And today, even as we speak, even as we speak, um, the, our governments are with the parties in Northern Ireland trying to iron out uh, some of the remaining issues. The point I'm simply making is these processes, these issues take time, they take patience, they take resilience. What I would say is, and the experience from Ireland, and so far as I would give you one experience from Ireland, is that you never, ever give up. You never walk away from the table. Once you get the parties in, you keep them in and you keep them at it. There will be setbacks, there are always setbacks. Ireland plays an active role in the European Union, um, through which obviously our membership of which gives us um, a voice uh, on all of these issues. Obviously we work with the United States and with the, um, with the United Nations and with the other partners out there um, in trying to advance uh, peace in the Middle East. It would be a wonderful achievement if it could be secured. Uh, difficult, uh, but uh, you know, obviously we salute and admire uh, the efforts particularly of Senator Mitchell uh, in trying to uh, move it forward and trying to bring it to uh, finality, but these are, these are very demanding issues and there's no easy fix, but um, hopefully with the uh, engaged engagement of all the parties and the United States is well committed to uh, finding a solution, uh, that a solution can be achieved at some stage in the reasonably near future. Thank you, Ambassador. I'm sure we'll all agree it's a fascinating day. Let's please give Ambassador Michael Collins. <laughs> Thank you again for joining us for this edition of the Ambassador Series, and we look forward to your joining us again. Thank you. Ambassador Series is brought to you in part by Prairie Heart Institute, the University of Illinois at Springfield, the Corporation for Public Broadcasting, and through the support of viewers like you. Thank you. For a DVD copy of this edition of the Ambassador Series, Send $24.95 to Network Knowledge, P.O. Box 6248, Springfield, Illinois, 62708. You may also order with your credit card by calling 800-232-3605. Be sure to include the program name, broadcast date, and topic.